Hey, welcome everybody to this serious online event with artist Fiona Kelly and geologist Dr. Robert Meehan. My name is Aideen Quirk, I'm the Programme and Operations Manager at Sirius in Cove. And um, before we begin, I would like to invite you all to the closing event of Fiona's exhibition on Saturday, the 20th of August from 3 to 5 p.m. For this event, Dawn Williams, the curator of exhibitions at the Crawford Art Gallery, will respond to Fiona's exhibition, a temporary iteration, and discuss the ideas and processes that inform the work, including questions of waste, demolition and organic regrowth. Williams will highlight the artist's use of new media and research to expand her formal and conceptual language. This closing event also includes the launch of a printed object that holds a response to the exhibition produced by the artist, featuring words by the curator Ali O'Shea. It's a free event and no booking is required. So now on to today's event, I'd like to introduce you to Fiona Kelly. She's an artist based in Cove, County Cork, whose research driven work addresses themes of ecology and society. Until the 20th of August, Sirius is presenting a solo exhibition by Fiona called A Temporary Iteration, combining sculpture, moving image and sound. In this project, Fiona engages with the Esker, a distinctly Irish landform. The project evolved through an artist residency at Gannon Eco, a plant located in a disused industrial quarry along the Esker Rieda that repurposes matter and byproducts of industrial manufacturing. I'd also like to introduce you to Dr. Robert Meehan, who is a dynamic geologist with a core interest in environmental geology, ice age formations, mining and sustainability. Based in the Midlands, Robert has done numerous reports and analysis for local authorities and national agencies, providing comprehensive geodiversity and biodiversity assessments, exploring the geodiversity potential of many sites and regions throughout Ireland, especially along the Esquire. From his base in County Mead and with associates throughout Ireland, Robert conducts focused field trips on various aspects of landscape heritage, geodiversity and environmental assessment projects throughout the Irish countryside. For today's online event, Dr Meehan will introduce us to the Esker landmass, which was formed during the last ice age. Delving into their formation and their idiosyncrasies, Dr Meehan and Fiona Kelly will discuss why the Esker is of such social and political importance in Ireland. So that's the introductions done. So Fiona and Ravi, off you go. Thanks so much, Edine. I was going to say a few words to contextualize um, this uh, afternoon, but I think uh, you've done it all so succinctly. Oh, so thank so you. That. Oh, that's brilliant. I, I prefer that. So we'll go straight into um, Robbie's presentation on the Eskers, if that's OK. And while he's setting up there, my phone just was throwing up at me this week that um, it was actually one year ago um, this week that we were out walking. Um, so thanks so much, Robbie, for answering um, a strange artist's email back in 2020 and uh, for coming along today. Thanks, Fiona. And uh, thanks to Sirius and Fiona for inviting me to speak here this evening. Um, I'm delighted to talk at any uh, prompt about the Ice Age and about Espers. I love them. And they are quite special uh, within our landscape. They're quite special in an Irish context also. And that's what I'm hoping that I'll kind of convey to you over the next half hour or so. So I'll, I'll talk about the Ice Age and just give a brief, brief background to that. I'll mention some of the landforms that you may have kind of, you know, you may have kind of heard of them. You may have done about them in Leaving Cert Geography uh, previously. Um, you may have seen them around Ireland because Ireland is awash with glacial landforms. And I'll talk about what the ice did to the country, how it kind of shaped it and what materials it left there. That's really the first 10 minutes or so. The majority of the talk is going to be about the eskers themselves. Eskers are a glacial landform uh, formed beneath the ice and they have importance worldwide. And as you'll see, even beyond worldwide, um, in that they've been seen on other planets. Um, and there are heritage aspects of them that are particularly important in an Irish context. And some of those heritage aspects, Fiona has examined in her uh, exhibition. And there's something that has, they're often, I think, unseen aspects of 
how we manipulate our landscape and how we use our landscape and how all of the various strands of the landscape, be it the geology, the, the you know, the rivers, the agriculture that's been practiced on it, uh, the ecology, the biodiversity, how they're all intertwined and they're all part of one holistic kind of earth element that, that we observe and we live in every day. So this is as technical as I'm going to get. I just want to show the geological time scale at the start of the talk and contextualize where the eskers are within that. So on the left hand side there, you can see the earth is 4,600 million years old, 4.6 billion years. And like it's mind boggling, you can't get your, your head around those sort of uh, time frames and time levels. And the way I sort of, uh, you know, I compare geological time uh, two is if if you if you think about money like we all know what 50 euros or 20 euros actually means in our pocket we know what it can buy we know what it can do but if you talk about thousands or even hundreds of thousands or millions of euros it's very difficult to get your head around that amount of money and time is the same we can contextualize you know 20 50 years within our, our lifespans but anything outside that and getting up into thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of years is really hard to conceptualize. But the, the 4.6 billion years that the Earth have been split up into various geological time periods, the most famous of those is top center there, the Jurassic. Uh, everybody probably has seen Jurassic Park, the time of the dinosaurs. And if we look at when the ice ages took hold on Earth, that's only in the last 2 million years or so. So it's a, it's a hair's breadth of time in terms of the history of the Earth. But those recent events really have sculpted and shaped our landscape in Ireland more than anything else. And they're what we observe when we look out the window at most of our landscapes across the country. And the Eskers form an important component of that. So ice ages. Believe it or not, we're living in an ice age now. You wouldn't think it on a warm evening like this evening um, and with the summer we've had and with all the talk of global warming and so on. But for long periods of the Earth's history, the Earth has had no ice on it. But we've had ice for about the last two million years or so on the Earth's surface. And we're looking there at Antarctica from the space shuttle nowadays. And what has happened every so often is that the ice sheets across the Arctic and the Antarctic have grown and covered the mid, mid latitudes and they've shrunk again and gone back into the Arctic, Arctic and Antarctic. And that's happened about 20 times, about every 100,000 years or so in the last 2 million years. So those incursions of ice that envelop the mid latitudes where Ireland sits are actually the ice ages that we've experienced in the country. And ice, when it covers the landscape, there's a few characteristics of it that means that it's very, very destructive. The first thing is it's very abrasive. If you look at ice under a microscope, this is what you see, very sharp crystals. And if you get an ice cube and you scrape your, your tongue with it, it'll cut you. So it's abrasive material. It's also very sticky. Many of you would recognize uh, this image from the film Dumb and Dumber, when that poor guy has his tongue stuck to a frozen uh, bar on a ski lift. Ice can also hold on to material. Here it's holding on to dye in a slush puppy, puppy, but it can hold on to mud, can hold on to clay, can hold on to silt, it can even hold on to gravel and big boulders. And the last facet of ice that's particularly important in terms of the glacial events are, is that it melts. Once the temperature rises, the ice will melt and release huge amounts of meltwater. And all of those characteristics of ice together mean that when the ice covers Ireland during the ice ages, it completely destroys all evidence of previous ice ages. We've only got a couple of little spots in the country where we've information about a couple of ice ages ago, but it reshapes the country and it leaves huge amounts of material on top of the bedrock. And if you think about the bedrock, there's only about 10% of the country has bedrock close to the surface. Most of Ireland is buried beneath deep soils and subsoils, which are the result of the ice ages, the glacial events. So the last ice age in Ireland started about 73,000 years ago. It was at its maximum 
about 20,000 years ago, and it finished about 10,000 years ago. Now, that's not all that long ago when you consider that the first humans uh, settled in Ireland eight, 9,000 years ago. Newgrange itself is five and a half thousand years old. So we're ice free for a relatively short period of time. And that has been the case for the last two million years. Ireland has been covered by ice completely more often than not. And research completed in 2012 drew up, I suppose, all of the previous evidence of ice ages that had been recorded in the geological literature for the last couple of hundred years. And a chronology was, was sort of drawn up as to how the ice sheet grew during the last ice age, how it covered the country, and then how it ret retreated back onto itself. So if you went back 27,000 years, like in the top left there, the ice that covered the country is that extension of the ice of Scandinavia and right back up to the Arctic. It extended down over Northern Britain and onto Ireland. The reason for that is basically we're close to the Atlantic. There's loads of moisture there so the ice sheet could grow. It didn't grow on continental Europe because there wasn't a source of moisture to feed the ice sheets. And then it retreated back onto itself. So if we went back 50,000 years um, and we were on top of one of the highest mountains in the country and we were looking over the countryside, this is what we'd see. The countryside completely enveloped, completely smothered in a very deep, a very thick, very extensive ice sheet. And only the very top of the highest mountains in the country stood up above the ice sheet. Those were called nun attacks, it's an Inuit word. Um, coming from the Canadian Arctic. And this is Vatna Yuckel, the uh, glacier ice sheet that covers most of Iceland nowadays. And you can see that only the highest peaks of mountains poke up above the ice. So if we look at Ireland nowadays, Crow Patrick, which is 764 metres above sea level, just that top 15 or 20 metres or so poked up above the ice as a non attack the rest of the country completely enveloped. So it's mind boggling how thick these glaciers and ice sheets were, how extensive they were. And if they're moving and if they're bulldozing and etching the material underneath uh, over which they flow, obviously they're gonna have quite a destructive um, impact on the landscape. And the ice moves, and this is something that's difficult to conceptualize, but how it moves is, once it attains a thickness of about 50 meters or more, it will start flowing a bit like wet concrete does as a kind of a solid liquid mass. And it will move over the landscape. It will pick up pieces of soil and mud and gravel. They become incorporated into the ice. The ice then gets more abrasive like sandpaper and it scratches and picks up more material. And over tens of thousands of years, you end up with huge volumes of debris within the ice. It's actually very dirty, which means that when the ice sheets retreat at the end of uh, the glacial event, what's left is billions and billions of tons of debris. And they're the soils and the subsoils that cover our landscape nowadays. So the landforms formed by the ice, you've heard about these in leaving search geography, ribbon rains, drumlins, arets, corries, fjords, erratics, U-shaped valleys striations. I'm not going to cover those. But throughout the country, if you look anywhere within Ireland, on, from a high point across the lowlands, you're going to see the highest peaks. You're going to see a, a, a landscape that's almost indiscernible in terms of the features within it. But when you're down within that landscape, all the individual hills and hummocks and humps and hollows are all visible and they're all the glacial features. And the material that's left is if you dig a, a hole in any back garden in the country, this is the bulldozed glacial material, the debris that's left on top of the rock. And that's different throughout the country, depending on the rock itself. But it's the same kind of hodgepodge of material wherever you go. Boulders, cobbles, gravels, sands, silts and clays. Now, when the ice starts to melt, this is where the eskers come into play. You get what's called deglaciation. You get a retreat of the ice fronts or margins back onto themselves. You get the landscape emerging. 
and you get the formation of a number of deglacial features. Again, you've probably heard about these in Leaving Cert Geography, moraines, outwash plains, glacial lakes, eskers, and kames and kettle holes. And I'm going to focus on the eskers. Esker itself is an English rendition of the Gaelic word esker, and that means a ridge that separates two plains. Eskers are recognisable features across much of central Ireland. They're long, low gravel ridges. They're valued for their cultural history, their geomorphical landscape, geomorphological landscape element, and especially as wildlife corridors, because they're important owing to the biodiversity they support. In many areas, they have semi-natural habitats like grassland, scrub or woodland. And in many cases, they've annexed one species rich calcareous grasslands, which are protected under the EU Habitats Directive. Eskers are often discontinuous. There's gaps between some ridges and others. And geomorphologists, because of this, they recognize esker systems, which make up a number of esker segments that all have a shared history. So you might have, in, in a county like Cork, you might have three esker segments which were deposited in the same tunnel under the ice over a distance of, say, about a kilometre, and that's one esker system. And the famous Irish naturalist Robert Lloyd Prager, in 1937, in his seminal book, The Way That I Went, he described eskers as often resembling abandoned railway embankments, and in effect, that's what they are. This is what they look like. Believe it or not, this ridge is a natural feature. And these eskers, these ridges, have been reported from all over the mid-latitudes, all of the areas that were glaciated historically in the last couple of million years. They're particularly common in Ireland. We gave the, the name to the geological uh, literature. They're common in Britain, they're common in Scandinavia, they're kind of common in Canada and Alaska and the northeastern United States and even in Patagonia in South America. They're termed Ozar in Scandinavia. So it's a little bit like Esker, the term. The most extensive Eskers are found in Canada in the districts of Key Watton eh, on Bath, Baffin Island, in Mackenzie and in Manitoba and northern Quebec. And some of those extend for up to 800 kilometers. So you're talking Cork to Belfast twice, one long Esker Ridge. And this is the Clon McNoise Esker, another view of it. Looking at Clon McNoise in the distance, you can actually see the round tower poking up among the trees. And Clon McNoise, the settlement, I know Aideen actually worked there historically. She was telling me that earlier on. Clon McNoise is built on an esker. And the reason for that is the eskers were important transport routes back in prehistoric times. And I'll cover that in a little bit more detail shortly. So at Clon McNoise, you've got the two great routes in Central Ireland meeting. You've got the Shannon Waterway and you've got the Esker Rieda, which again, I'll come to shortly. Now the Eskers are composed of gravels sometimes cobble size, the size of football, sometimes boulders, even bigger than that. And you can see that this is a cross section of the Schlieve Dart Esker up in North County Galway. And you can see that they're, they're made up completely of just sands and gravels and cobbles and boulders. And some of the boulders are up to a couple of meters across. So it takes a huge amount of energy to get those moving um, in under the ice. Now, the bare facts about eskers in Ireland, I'll just focus on Ireland uh, firstly with regards to the stats. There's 310 individual esker systems in the country, and they make up 2,159 esker segments. I know this, I've counted them all. The vast majority of them were formed in tunnels that remained open underneath the ice, and they would have been there for several hundred, if not thousands of years. And these sometimes comprise very long esker segments. Others were deposited as short-lived subglacial events, just short tunnels that might have been only open for a couple of years underneath the ice. So the Cranny Esker system in County Clare, which is the shortest one in the country, that makes up only one esker segment deposited in a tunnel only 70 metres long, not even the length of the football field. And then at the other end of the scale, the longest esker system in the country is the Glengowla 
in Galway to look an escrow system. And that stretches as 99 individual segments with little gaps between them, almost 210 kilometers across the center of Ireland. And this is the famed escrow reader. So most of the escrow systems are made up of a number of segments. Only 66 have one segment. The longest individual segment in the country is just under nine kilometers long. And it's one of the features that myself and Fiona looked at last summer, uh, the Forban Rehu escrow system, and that's sometimes called the Rehu Ridge. The sort of segment is only 27 meters long, part of the sleeve esker, sleeve dart esker system that I showed you earlier in County Gaul, only 27 meters long. You'd pace it in a couple of seconds. And that only covers 138 square meters. It's, it's tiny, absolutely tiny, not even the size of your front driveway. The largest esker segment aerially in the country is the Mount Temple Esker or part of the Mount Temple Esker or Moat Esker near Athlone, and that covers 1.45 square kilometers. And Ireland has a total land area of 70,000 square kilometers. Eskers account for 100, just over 100 square kilometers of this, that's only 0.14% of the area of the country. But because they're quite striking, they're quite famous, regardless of the fact that they only cover a very small part of the country itself. And this is the pattern of them. All those black lines show the Esker systems across the country. And they look a little bit like rivers. And that is reflecting the way they were deposited at the base of the ice sheet. So Eskers are formed in tunnels underneath the ice. As the ice starts to melt back, it doesn't just kind of prolapse and sink onto the ground like you'd see after a snowfall nowadays. What happens is, the meltwater becomes organized in tunnels and you have a very ordered retreat of the ice margin back onto itself. And that means that these tunnels are kind of caves almost underneath the ice. They end up being filled with water every summer when you have more melting than you do freezing. And the tunnel in the bottom left there is about four meters high. I'm actually in that tunnel in Iceland a number of years ago. And what happens with the tunnels is as well, by times, gravels will fall into the tunnels or get carried into the tunnels by the rivers, by the water that flows through them. And they will then accumulate in the base of the tunnel and eventually they'll form these long chains of sand and gravels. And then when the ice all melts away, what's left is this long, sinuous embankment, which is the escrow. So it's a somewhat complex idea as to how they're formed, but it's quite simple at the same time when you, when you understand it. So when the ice melts from around these tunnels, what's left is quite a high, almost domed ridge of sand and gravel. Very steep slopes on the side, and that means that these areas have never been ploughed on the side of the eskers, and usually with quite shallow soils as well. And the soils that form on top of them are only a few inches thick. Because the sand and gravel is so permeable and so well drained, all the rainfall just flows down through them and you wanna get a thin mat of organic material on the surface of the esker as the soil. So those soils are called either renzinas or brown earths, commonly, they're the most common type of soil on the eskers themselves. And in terms of geomorphology, in terms of their form, they sometimes have very, very complex uh, arrangements in the landscape, just depending on how the river was flowing underneath the ice. So you get beautiful, on the old six inch maps of the geological survey, you get these beautiful depictions of the eskers. And on then even laterally, as the Ordnance Survey came into play and later on in the 18th and 19th century, some of the earliest annotated maps showed these ridges on the land surface. And nowadays you can actually see them on the aerial photographs. Oftentimes they just look like sinuous corridors of forestry because you often have native woodland growing on the eskers. Again, this hasn't been cut generally for millennia.
and their form is recognizable anywhere. So these images here, there's no vegetation on them, but we can still see the esker features. And what's incredible about these images are, these images show what are called the dorsa argentia, which are a series of ridges, believe it or not, on Mars. Eskers have been discovered on Mars, and they're the reason why NASA believes glaciers once existed on Mars, because there's eskers there. So if we go back to ancient Ireland, ancient Ireland, you're talking about ancient oak forest across the majority of the country, thick, dense forest. This is Killarney National Park today. As well as that, where we have the bogs now and where we have the lower lying areas of the country now, they would have been just marsh. So you're talking about an, a Mordor type of landscape. You're talking about bogs, mires across huge, vast tracts of the Irish landscape. And these eskers then, for anybody who is moving within that landscape, were a godsend because the eskers generally would have had thinner forest cover than the lowlands, and as well as that, they were high and dry ridges. So if we look at roadways in ancient Ireland, these are the Schlee Moor, the Schlee Gala, the Schlee Asile, which are three of the more famous uh, routeways across the middle of the country in Irish folklore. They follow esker systems. So roads, even nowadays, oftentimes top esker systems. And the sides of eskers I mentioned earlier oftentimes have not been ploughed. They've got very thin soils. But because of that, the grasslands on them are generally ancient. They've never been touched. And that means that you get a unique biodiversity there as well. In terms of roads, this is down in County Limerick and Carrickerry. The esker itself is only about two, two and a half metres tall, but the road is still built on top of it across boggy terrain. And laterally, some of the pilgrim paths, particularly that at Clon McNoise, have become important walking routes. So eskers actually have a, a place and they have a, a, a part of our tourist heritage also. In terms of biodiversity, they're really important though. These ancient grasslands that have very rare flowers growing on them. Some of the rare flowers and orchids that grow in the burren, again, they're mirrored on eskers. And ecologists therefore would often map the eskers themselves and map the habitats on them and create habitat and biodiversity maps, showing that they're completely unique compared to the, just the, the the blanket of grassland around them, of just dry, dry, improved grassland. And in terms of biodiversity, they're also important because of fauna. Sand martens there will burrow within them. Badgers, I love that photo on the right-hand side there. You can see the badger claws actually heading up to the, the set, the burrow in the set within the esker. Rabbits will also burrow in, in them. So animals are attracted to the eskers because they're dry. They're full of sand and gravel, Rainfall, not a problem. It flies through them, no water table. So that's where you want to raise your young. That's where you want to build your burrows and your sets. And then in terms of aggregates, eskers are also important. And how this probably evolved was just like on the left-hand side there, uh, historically, you would have had farmers clearing, small clearings uh, for their yards. They'd take out the esker gravels that might grow into a relatively small gravel pit. And nowadays we get these huge gravel pits covering very large areas. Most of our major gravel pits are within the eskers. And they're also important heritage wise and folklore wise in terms of place names. Places like Clonascra, which is near Clonmacnoise itself. The Ridge of Maryborough there uh, outside Port Leash is an esker system. Esker itself is in innumerable place names around the country. There's 20 to 25 townlands just called Esker. We've got Tully Esker, we've got Rathflesk, Ahaskra in East Galway, all have a derivation within the Esker. And I'm just going to finish off there with a couple of little idiosyncrasies, which leads me into Fiona's uh, part of the discussion. This is the Rehu Church along the Rehu Esker Ridge on the Alfalee Westmead County boundary. 
And I love this because they put the church bell on top of the esker itself because that's the highest point in the area and the sound is going to carry much further than if it was on the roof of the church itself. And then finally, along the N52 in Tullamore, along again, this huge uh, esker ridge, the Bally Duff esker that passes Tullamore, there have been a number of sculptures uh, in place in the last few years. And they're landmarks really on the eskers, which are landmarks themselves. So that's my presentation. I hope I haven't gone through it too quickly. I hope you got something from it and I'm looking forward to the discussion now over the next few moments. That was brilliant, Robbie. Thanks so much. Um, I'm just going to start like I have. I'll always have questions about eskers, but I hope that other people will join in um, and, and and talk a little bit about it. What I was really interested in, Robbie, especially like when I started looking at them uh, and I couldn't Google an esker without your name coming up. Um, with all the surveys and I liked when you said that you counted every single esker. Um, so why do you think the eskers are kind of these overlooked or unconserved places? You know, they were so rich in our heritage, in our place names. Like my friend is in um, Canada at the moment and sent me a photograph of a bottle of water that said esker, you know, in the Irish spelling. Yeah. On it. So why, why are these places almost not known? Or do people hear, uh, um, you know, maybe people, everybody knows about them, but when I start to talk about them, they're very overlooked areas. Um, and why do you think that is? I, I, I actually think it's a great question, Fiona. I think one of the reasons is that geologists like myself are particularly poor sometimes at communication. Um, Within the geological community, you know, it's been known for 150 years how important the eskers are here uh, in, in, you know, in a landscape sense and in a historical sense, in a folklore sense, in a, a biodiversity sense. But it's just not sometimes uh, got out there as good as it could be. And, you know, one, one of the reasons for that is, you know, Oftentimes geologists are guys like myself with glasses and grey beards and they like staying in offices and they like going out then and look for fossils and things like that. And we're a very sort of enclosed community almost. But I think with the advent in the last few years of, first off, the advent of uh, conservation and preservation properly in Ireland. I think the EU, we have to thank for that, like the Habitats Directive and the Birds Directive, which is really why many of our eskers are now protected as special areas of conservation or special protection areas. Um, there was an old list back in the 1960s uh, drawn up by Forest Furbaha of geomorphological and geomorphological sites of significance, but they were only a snapshot of what was out there, you know, blanketly across the country. So in the last few years, the fact that there are areas that are protected because of habitats and birds and the eskers are part of that fabric, yeah. you've actually got a protective element on many of them now, which is, is good. In the last 10, 15 years or so, the Geological Survey have begun uh, completing geological heritage audits, which they're doing at a county level from kind of the bottom up, from the local scale up, which means that a lot of the local features are now being recorded also better and more consistently, as I say, from the bottom up. And that's meaning that a lot of the, the local stories, the local um, folklore elements, habitat elements that are not known at a national level are making it into the reports that we've been completing and making it into county development plans in terms of protecting them as well. So it's it's just a facet, I think, of how science and geology particularly uh, evolved over the last 150 years. But now that there is a protective element uh, in terms of habitats and in terms of birds, and also in terms of geology and geomorphology with the county geological sites, the geological survey now rank, um, I think that it, it's starting to become more consistent, more better mapped at a countrywide level, 
And hopefully the educational element will follow on from that. And I think that this evening is part of that story also, just getting it out there to people. Yeah, yeah. So in like our conversations and and my own research, it was like 1984 um, in Anilova, we, we talked about this ourselves, put it forward for conservation. But just in your answer there, it was the habitats that are conserved rather than the landmass. Yeah, that's right. So I, I find that fascinating. And I love, you know, you know I, the Esker has always been part of my youth, my memory, uh, because I grew up on the Split Hill, Long Hill Esker. Which yes. Is, like, just fabulous. Um, it's a, if anybody's in the Midlands, you should visit it. And it is a, a habitat and it is conserved and it is such a beautiful place. But there's so many that are just... You know, when we went walking and we hopped some gates, you know, there's this, the, the topsoil um, removed and, you know, there, there are sites of excavation, like, um, you know, our, our extraction. And I love seeing them because it's these frozen strata of, of time. They're yes. like a time capsule, even though it's quite early when you think about all the millions of years. But how... Like, do you think your surveys, sorry, it's a long way around to get to, do you think the surveys will will end up in these Esker geoparks or that they will be conserved like they are in Denmark or Canada, say, or? Yeah, I'd, I'd be hopeful that they would. Um, one, of, one of the difficulties is uh, that, you know, we have special areas of conservation and we've these SPAs, the special protection areas because of birds and habitats, uh, because of those EU directives. Uh, there are dozens, there's actually hundreds of proposed natural heritage areas around the country also that have been proposed for the last 25 years, um, but they've never made it legally into a protected status. And being honest with you, the many of the bogs that you hear people talking about all the time on the radio are part of that as well. And but those nat those natural heritage areas, the NHAs that are proposed, they're there because of their geomorphology or their geology or some natural element of the feature that is unique. And there's dozens of escrows within that group. But until there's a statutory designation and an Irish law that protects them fully, that's only when they'll be fully protected. Mm -hmm. um, as I say, there's, there's some of them that are protected piecemeal as because of habitats and because of birds. Um, but it's really because of the, the, the eskers are almost the secondary element that's been protected. The land area that covers them is protected because of their habitats and their birds, but it's yeah. not the feature itself. And mm -hmm. I think when that when that last link in the chain of conservation is closed, and when you actually get a full blanket protection for the habitats and the birds and the geomorphology, which is then related to the flora and fauna as well, I think you've got, you've you've got a better kind of situation there. Okay. But at a local level, it's important to note that these county geological sites that Geological Survey have been ranking and designating over the last 20 years or so, they do have protection in county development plans. So if somebody is, look, even though you may not have a special area conservation or a special protection area on an esker, say in County Westmeath or Offaly, because they've been designated as county geological sites and ranked as county geological sites, if somebody's looking to build a house there, they will have to consult with geological survey. You know, you probably won't be allowed to put a landfill there. You won't be allowed to put any major industrial facility there. And even things like gravel pits and quarries would have an element of protection and geological survey would have an input into that because they're they're ranked as county geological sites. And I think that's an important step and that has only happened in the last couple of decades. Yeah, thanks so much. I'm gonna open um, up to questions now, Robbie, but I just wanted to maybe say something in terms of my research and the Eskers and I think why I'm drawn to them so much um, is the fact of their formate, they formed when something 
died or ceased. So the rivers and the meltwater, and it had this vitality to it. And that, you know, when you think of production, even like image production or being an artist, you you think of, you know, movement and things moving forward. But when it stayed in the same place and this idea of fallowness, it became this amazing place for biodiversity just by being and not being removed. So I think my whole project is this fallow area over decades, that it is this biodiversity wildlife corridor, as you described it. Um, and it is that kind of look into the past when you think of the esker um, in the split hills, you know, when they have the oak trees and hazel and the flora and fauna. Um, so I just like the idea, I suppose, and that's why you were drawn to geology of looking at something in the long term yeah, or yeah. something that supports everything else by just being and by not being removed. Um, so that's just a statement, I suppose. Um, so if, do people want me to read the questions or do they want to ask? There's a really interesting question there from Bill O'Flynn in the chat. So I don't know, Bill, do you want to ask that yourself? Or Fiona, do you want to read it out? Of course, there's an interesting question from Bill. Thanks, Bill. Do you want me to read it? Go on, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, well, she's unmuted herself there, so. No, I have no problem, Fiona. I was just having a fumbling with the computer there. So uh, if you want to, if you want to read that out, I have no problem. No, no, go on yourself there. Please. Okay, uh, I was interested in the map of Ireland with the extent of the eskers uh, shown on it. And it seemed to me there was very little below a line somewhere between Limerick and um, maybe Arklow or someplace like that. And I was wondering, was that, uh, was that because that was the extent of the ice sheet in the last glaciation? Um, and the next question, uh, part of that was, um, is it possible that they were traces of eskers from earlier glaciations still still detectable in the south of the country? That's uh, several brilliant questions uh, together. Um, I'll, for, I'll, I'll maybe do them uh, slightly higgledy-piggledy, Bill, if you're happy with that. First off, the extent of the ice sheet uh, during the last glaciation. Um, Ireland was completely covered and the ice sheet extended uh, about 120 kilometres off the south coast. And it also extended about 150 kilometres off the west coast. And it's kind of hard to get your head around that, but you have to realise that during the, the, the last time that Ireland was covered by ice, there was so much of the earth's water locked up in ice sheets compared to now. Sea levels were about 110 meters lower than they are now. So the ice just extended onto the continental shelf. So we have eskers all over the country, but as you say, very few outside the Midlands are kind of concentrated in the Midlands. And they're kind of concentrated in the lowest elevation areas. They tend not to form if I remember when I was at school, like we were always told that Ireland was like a saucer and that the highest parts were around the edge. And it is like that, like you've got mountains all the way around the coast. You've got the uplands and Cork and Kerry, for instance, and all the way up along the west coast into Donegal and so on. And the Midlands, the low point in the centre where the limestone bedrock is underneath, that's the lowest elevation topographic kind of region. And if you think about it, the, as the ice sheets are melting, the water is going to be concentrated in the lowest areas because it's just going to flow like it does nowadays by gravity. So the, the water was concentrated at the base of the ice in the lowest parts of the country, uh, which was the Midlands. And that's why we have such a dense concentration of them within the Midlands. In terms of how the ice retreated back, it effectively just retreated from south to north the margin just went across the country from if you if you think of cork and kerry it just gradually went up 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 and left us and headed off towards scotland as the ice was retreating 
And in terms of previous ice ages, we do know that the escrows that we have are all from the last ice age, with, with, without any uh, doubt. Um, they're very fragile features, and that's something that you've, in a way, alluded to, uh, Fiona. The fact that they can be dug out so easily with diggers, even by hand, you can get into the sand and the gravel and start shoveling them out. They're very fragile. And because of that, if you had an ice sheet cover in the countryside, they'd be the first thing almost completely obliterated because they're so loose. Completely different to boulder clay, which is deposited and kind of smeared and has very high consolidation values at the base of the ice, or rock. They're much, much harder materials. The sand and gravels within the eskers are quite soft and they'll be obliterated very, very quickly. So all of the eskers that we have like the earliest ones are probably from about 19,000 years ago, and they were all formed in a very short snapshot for about 5,000 years uh, of all these rivers forming under the ice. They're all really within that age bracket. So I hope that wasn't too technical. Oh, again. That your question. <laughs> no, that was excellent. Um, it, it's, um, it's great because I, I'm looking at features of the landscape near where I live and thinking, where did that originate? Now I know one thing has been eliminated out of the question. Um, and yeah, I, it's, uh, it's interesting. I'd always been curious about why these things were so recent effectively. But of course, if the last glaciation covered the whole country, it's going to scour everything, isn't it? that was yes. existing beforehand. Exactly, it's very, very destructive. And uh, you know, the ice sheets in Antarctica, the ice sheets in Iceland and Greenland nowadays, they're constantly just gouging the landscape over which they're passing, just like our ice sheet did when it was covering us. Great, thank you very much. Um, doesn't look like there are any other questions there now. Um, I think that was really interesting, Robbie and Fiona. Um, thank you so much. And um, I just put a note in the chat there for anyone who missed the beginning of the talk. And um, this recording will be made available on YouTube next week. So it'll be sent out to everybody. Um, uh, Fiona, do you want to introduce um, your video um, or say any other words and then play out? Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for coming on such a sunny evening and a special thanks to Aideen uh, for organising, doing all the tech and um, to Robbie, like I had such a good time last year walking around and thanks for like taking um, a request from an artist and just being like, I just want to learn more about these these systems and being so generous um, with the information that you've given. Um, so I have made um, a, a response to the information that I've learned through uh, walking with Robbie, walking on the Eskers and a um, residency that I've been doing in Gananico, which is a re waste repurposing plant uh, based out of a disused quarry on the Esker, um, on the Split Hill, Long Hill, Esker. So I'm just going to end um, this evening with showing a video of the installation and um, for those who may have not got to Cove. Um, so the installation is built from um, scalahedron forms, which are um, minute limestone crystals, which I got to ask uh, Robert, Robbie about as well. Um, so these wooden forms that I've built and I kind of wanted them to tessellate and feel very unsettled within the gallery space like they'd almost been just washed there and they're very precarious um sitting on each other um tessellating almost the echoing the fragility of the esker systems um that they're kind of formed by chance but yet a very beautiful um, container for biodiversity, for regrowth, for rejuvenation, and this idea of um, fallowness and how important um, fallowness is um, 
it's not just nothing happening. It's giving, it's demarcating a space for something beautiful to happen and something to be rebuilt or be wholly productive spaces by just allowing them be spaces. So um, I'm just going to play out with the video. If your dinner's ready or you need to go see the sun, um, you can come and see the installation itself in Cove at the Sirius. And I'm having a closing event for those who joined late um, on the 20th of August. So you're more than welcome to come. So I hope you enjoy the video. It's still a rough draft, but it gives a nice sense of, of, of the exhibition. And thanks again um, to everybody. <laughs>